everybody. Welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Hope you're ready for some truth first Christianity today. If there was a country we know today that could easily be and should be included in discussions about the first five major Christian centers, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Byzantium, and Rome, it would have to be Ethiopia. Eusebius gives us more detail on the account of the conversion of the eunuch, uh, the eunuch that belonged to Kandake, the sister of the king of Cush, who herself would become queen in a long line of female queens in Ethiopia, the Greek translation of her name being Candace. Cush uh, being one of the ancient names for Ethiopia, of course. Kandake would be next in line, and as we're going to see in the New Testament in Acts chapter 8, uh, the eunuch was resting on the litter reading from the book of Isaiah, and Philip converted him to Christianity, which he took back to Ethiopia. Before that, our journey into Ethiopia today, though, goes back into the ancient Old Testament. See, Moses married a Cushite woman. A Ethiopian woman named Zephra, Sephora, Zephra, uh, that the later church tried to make a different woman, claiming Moses had two wives, uh, but he didn't. He had a black wife, that's the bottom line, uh, who may have been royalty, and the marriage arranged in a peace treaty between uh, what were at the time called the Nubians and the Egyptians. Uh, I'm going to read to you from the book of Numbers. Uh, the account of Moses' brother and sister being very angry at him for this marriage. And then we're going to take a look at why they were angry. It's uh, Numbers chapter 12, and it says, Dissension of Aaron and Miriam. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses, questioning his leadership and authority after having married an Ethiopian? What's wrong with him? So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of the meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then God said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord when they were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Now the dialogue continues, but given our modern social issues that we're having regarding the idea that there's more than one human race, and that certain races with higher levels of melanin receive... Um, unfair, unequal treatment. This passage can sound a lot like race. We have anger over Moses marrying a Cushite, an Ethiopian, and then we have Miriam being turned into a leper, white as snow, right? Do you see how it could be viewed that way? But that's not the case. The anger is because, remember, Moses came from Egypt. He was raised as an Egyptian, and he was raised in the court of the Pharaoh. And he married this Ethiopian woman who was probably royalty uh, and a relative of the king as a uh, treaty of peace between the Nubians and the Egyptians at the time. And that's what the anger was over. But I'm not saying anybody's off the hook. Let me continue. It goes back to King David's love affair with Bathsheba even, right? And their son Solomon's children with his Ethiopian wife. 
perhaps ruling in the Kushite region at the time. Uh, they say that the Ark of the Covenant actually ended up there. Uh, read the sign and the seal by Graham Hancock for more great information on that. He was a journalist for the Associated Press. Uh, ended up in Axum studying their civil war, totally unrelated to any religious topic. Now get this, when he began hearing about the Ark of the Covenant, allegedly in Axum with the Ethiopians, the lost one of the lost tribes of Israel, he was intrigued and he went to talk to a few of the men who had retired from their daily task of having to guard the Ark. He assumed it was a local legend for the Taurus until an interesting and subtle fact kept appearing over and over again. The man who had been in charge of watching the Ark had developed cataracts on their eyes and they said to Graham Hancock, my friend, the Ark is a thing of fire. That is certainly enough to develop an interest in studying the subject. This intrigued him enough to go back into the history and trace Solomon's journey and the potential journey of the Ark into Axum. Even to this day, there is a tribe of what are now Christian Jews in Axum practicing the sacrifices and everything until in 2003 the uh, Jews in Israel said you can't do this anymore, but they had continued to do so. Now. There's a lot of modern arguing about Ethiopia, and there's a movement, a good movement in my opinion, where uh, black Americans are looking back and saying, hey, our history is underrepresented. Where is it? There are a lot of great black contributions, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, the same thing holds true for the early church, as are some of the examples I'm going to get into here about Ethiopia. But like any spectrum, it runs from really crazy outlandish claims to um, not enough being included, and the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. Now, in their attempt to trace Ethiopia back to human origins, which has a lot of validity, those that argue that position forget how many Christians are in Ethiopia. It was originally included in Alexandria, one of the five major Christian centers. 32 to 35 million Christians prior to the Catholic Church. In fact, the Catholic Church is to blame for why we view this country as Ethiopia and why we view this country as new Christians, and that only goes back to the 1800s. But 32 to 35 million Christians. Uh, in the 4th century, eventually they're absorbed into what became the Coptic Church, the Egyptian Coptic Church. Again, that connection to Alexandria, which is in Egypt. Remember, uh, two of the first five major Christian centers, Alexandria and Antioch, were in Africa, right? So is it that much of a stretch to suggest that Ethiopia was a major center too? You have Jerusalem, a major Christian center. Then you have Gaza, right across into Egypt, south to uh, Ethiopia, near Sudan, etc. Now, uh, by the New Testament, Cush was still powerful. There's still a strong presence of what was once part of, and this is where the Ethiopians first broke from what was becoming the universal church in the early 4th century after the First Council of Nicaea. By the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon, they split from that universal tradition and became part of what would be known as the Oriental Orthodox Church. That's where those numbers 32 to 35 million come from. They eventually absorbed into the Coptic Church. So they are not in the tradition of Western Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Although Protestantism is the second largest denomination today in Ethiopia. But they have books in their canon, for example, that are not in the West. If you talk to any evangelical Western Christian, they're going to criticize any review of the book of Enoch, Jasher, Jubilee as, oh, well, they're not divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? They're included in the canon of the Ethiopian church. These things matter. Uh, there's more than just Western uh, Christianity out there. So, 
it only starts being called Ethiopia in recent times, as I said. The locals, first of all, called their collection of about 52 to 54 countries on the continent as Alkebulon, which means Mother of Mankind or Garden of Eden. Might I point you to the work of Michael Tellinger, an amateur archaeologist uh, who found a lot of very interesting uh, artifacts in South Africa and his work is uh, widely celebrated although he doesn't get a lot of attention because he comes from the amateur world and not uh, the world of academia. So what does book two of Eusebius' church history tell us about what we know as Ethiopia? And let me start by reading you the account in the Bible, Acts chapter 8, where we get the eunuch the Ethiopian eunuch uh, converted to Christianity and he takes the faith back to Ethiopia. Let's start with that. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Philip was one of the early evangelists. To paint you a picture about the time of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, you had about seven deacons, 46 presbyters, all kind of beginning to develop and build up around these major Christian centers. The apostles were active, and then the first generation of apostolic fathers, meaning the students of the apostles, they were taking root. But Philip was a, a key uh, person. So an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go south toward the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. You have to picture this. Jerusalem, south to Gaza, across into Egypt, south into Ethiopia, or by water, straight from the southern Israel, Yemen area, straight across into Ethiopia. We're not talking about that much distance. So Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. We, Candace, again, being that Greek name for Kandake. Now, Biblical scholars will say, oh, she was a ruler in Egypt. Well, she wasn't yet. At this time, her brother was still the king of Cush, but she was next in line. And woman, women would rule Ethiopia for a very long time. That was a common tradition. Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Well, who was? The eunuch. So the eunuch is in an entourage with Kandake. They had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Philip hears from God, goes south from Jerusalem to Gaza. So basically what we're being told is that they traveled by caravan back then. That Philip and uh, Kandake and the eunuch were all in this south-traveling caravan, essentially. And the eunuch is reading from the prophet Isaiah here in Philip. Now, the eunuch and Kandake are not Christians. They were not in Jerusalem worshiping as Christians. Remember, they are tribes of the Jews. They are one of or more of the 12 tribes. Their history goes back to David. Their history goes back to Moses. The ark is allegedly there. They are worshiping as Jews. Philip sees the eunuch reading fit, uh, um, uh, prophet Isaiah, think of like Isaiah 53, one of the key prophecies about Jesus Christ, and he says to the eunuch, do you know what you're reading, friend? And the eunuch basically says, how can I know what I'm reading without someone to tell me? And let's see what happens. And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. The place in scripture he had read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Let me pause for one second, because remember, in other videos, we've talked about this. Philip is teaching the prophet Isaiah to a new potential convert. Peter 
in the book of Acts. When he has his first chance to make a speech to a whole rack of people about the Lord Jesus Christ, he goes to the prophet Joel. When Stephen the martyr first becomes a leader in the church and goes to the Sanhedrin, the same ones that killed Jesus, what does he do? He talks about the prophets. For the early Christians, it was all about the prophecy having been fulfilled and the death and resurrection. Let's go on. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is some water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The eunuch, on the other hand, took that faith back to Ethiopia. In Alkebulon, the first name of Africa, 54 countries. That's something, let me tell you. I talk to a lot of uh, Christians with higher levels of melanin, denominations that tend to attract uh, people of color. One of the things that really irks them and lets them know that you are not even on the same page is when you don't know how many countries there are in Africa. But that's not unique. Americans, we're not very good at geography, knowing what's going on in other countries. So, Now, what does Book 2 of Eusebius' church history tell us about what we know as the Ethiopian? This is a short read. Thank you for sticking with me. We're going to get through this today, everybody. But as the preaching of the Savior's gospel was daily advancing, a certain providence led from the land of the Ethiopians. An officer, the eunuch, of the queen of that country for Ethiopia, even to the present day, is ruled according to ancestral custom by a woman. He first among the Gentiles. Now we get a detail not even in the scripture. This is the first Gentile baptized into Christianity outside of the main area that they were in. Maybe even before Cornelius, which I think is Acts chapter 10. If that's the case, Ethiopia is one of the most important cities in early Christianity because the eunuch was the first Gentile baptized into Christianity. And he went back home and he talked to the ruling family as their courtier about the Christian faith. Fascinating. He first among the Gentiles received of the mysteries of the divine word from Philip in consequence of a revelation and having become the first fruits of believers throughout the world, he is said to have been the first on returning to his country to proclaim the knowledge of the God of the universe and the life-giving sojourn of the Savior among men, so that through him in truth the prophecy obtained is fulfillment, which declared that Ethiopia stretched out her hand unto God. In addition to these, Paul, that chosen vessel, not of men, neither through men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself and of God the Father, who had raised him from the dead, was appointed an apostle, being made worthy and called by a vision and by a voice which was uttered in the revelation of heaven. That second part about Paul is not related to Ethiopia. I didn't catch to stop there, but in Acts chapter 8 at the beginning, Paul is still persecuting Christians, and by the end of that chapter, he has been converted on the road to Damascus. That's where that comes from. So, excuse me for that. Now, why do we hear about this? Why, why are we taught about this? This is such important history. It's possible because at the time, this was considered part of the Alexandrian theater of early Christianity. All right, that's an innocent explanation, right? Um, now, this is important church history, that, though, and there's a lot I find that is neglected to be told. Some believe it's a whitewashing of history where black achievement of history is excluded. Um, others believe that we've uh, been in the line of European and Western rulership 
uh, for so long, going back to Charles the Hammer Martel, Charlemagne, the 7 and 800s a, uh, AD, um, that our art, history, and literature favors the fairer skinned from the north. The victors write the history, after all. Uh, the truth is that both seem to occur. The whitewashing of history. Imagine the potential concern of white evangelicals to find out that Moses and Solomon married black women, right? Um, uh, that Solomon's children might have been half black. Oh, the, the intrigue, right? That these types of uh, things. As you know, these aren't my thoughts, so forgive my sarcasm as we go along and take it uh, for what it is. So the other side is more innocent, and I believe this is also true. Most Christian art we see today comes from the Italian Renaissance, a period of time named for its art, science, developments in humanism, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. Most of the art made it in Italy, they made it look like them, and it was paid for by uh, popes from Spain, France, and Italy overwhelmingly during that time, um, and I think that's why we see that. Um, it was largely paid for by these Renaissance popes who were notoriously corrupted, uh, and they had the gold. So, uh, by the same token, if one were to go to Constantinople, where mosaic art originates, you're going to see... Uh, tapestries and pictures of Jesus with slightly darker skin. Um, if you go to uh, anywhere in Alkebulon, south of the Mediterranean during the Middle Ages, except maybe the Moroccans and Berbers, which were definitely not, not necessarily uh, dark, dark, but uh, people of color, um, in Africa they would have been darker, right? Uh, as with everything in all the narratives, they all have some truth, some more dominant than others. So, uh, the things we've read today, the Old Testament account of Moses marrying the Cushite Sephra, um, Solomon and his family in Cush, uh, Philip converting the New Testament eunuch of the Queen of Ethiopia, Eusebius writing in Book 2 of the Church History, uh, the split from the developing Christianity over the time of the Fifth Ecumenical Council at Chalcedon, um, which came from the growing orthodoxy at the time, East and West, and the exact issue had to do with their creation of a Christological hypostasis, Jesus, his humanity and divinity and what it meant. But there was already some tension over previous councils. Pope Leo, the Bishop of Rome, during this council had essentially uh, handed in an order, here's what we're all going to do. But, you know, not everybody was down with Rome being in charge kind of thing. So... You know, those who split naturally end up being called heretics in the Western Christian tradition, but even though these churches are strong today, I mean, the Oriental Church is still strong today. Um, Ethiopia is one of the strongest Christian nations on the globe, although in recent years it's become increasingly Muslim. You have this strong Jewish tradition taking place in, in uh, Aksum. Um, there are many Protestants. Protestantism is second in uh, Ethiopia as far as Christian faiths. Now, the, Catho the Catholicism defined these nations often without Eastern help, uh, and they introduced Ethiopia to Christianity through their Jesuits in the 1800s. Um, often, um, it, you know, it led to a lot of problems, and, and this is might be why we don't hear a lot about Ethiopia in early church history, because no matter how much Protestants don't like it, the repositories of the early church history are, guess where, in the Vatican. You can't study early church history without having to uh, study Catholicism right along with it. So, um, it's important to note that at the time, Alexandria included uh, the Nubians, the Cushites, uh, or what we would call Ethiopia. Uh, up to that point, key blacks crucial to church history, such as Athanasius of Alexandria, uh, the key hero of the First Council of Nicaea, and who wrote one of the most huh, just touching documents on Trinitarian Christianity that exists. Um, or that according to the ancient book of the popes, Liber Pontificalis, there were 11 popes from Africa prior to the fall of Rome in the late 400s and early 500s. Um, and finally, the modern church in Axum is kind of a big, uh, a big deal. But a general rule to help us when uh, reading about Antioch, Alexandria, Cush, Ethiopia, um, and Alkebulon, uh, Africa, uh, 
uh, when reading about early church history, get away from thinking that they're all bearded white men. We can't help it because those are the pictures that we're all exposed to. It, it happens naturally. It happened naturally for me. One of my viral videos, a uh, whole Bible explained like a boss in under 30 minutes or something, and all the artwork I had placed in there just to have something placed in there were white biblical characters. And to tell you the truth, before that I had never thought of it. But thousands of comments, you know, uh, hey dude, these people probably were not white. And that got me thinking a lot about it. And then I went and started reading people like uh, Professor Van Sertema to see, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, I should probably think about this and be a little more sensitive about this. And then when I was reading some of the great theologians in history, I came across Athanasius of Alexandria. And only after reading all this wonderful work from this man, as an afterthought, it was almost that, oh yes, by the way, he was an African, darker skin, you know. It's amazing. So, um, you know, it is possible that the answer to this is simple non-conspiratorial reasons that, you know, we just don't get much past generic historical narratives in any subject. Um, you know, uh, splitting from the three main evolutions practiced by the power brokers of the the last 10 centuries, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, more recently Protestantism, I can see how their history of the church would fall into the background a little bit. Um, but Alexandria is in Egypt, Antioch is in Egypt, uh, right there near Libya, you know, Jerusalem's right across Gaza from there, so should give us a proper context and tone for analyzing these things in the future. And I think it's fascinating. Thank you for listening uh, today. Uh, God bless you. And as always, may your work today bear fruit. If you'd like to purchase a book that I've written, you can visit Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett and uh, go get one from the Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity series or another fascinating uh, story that happens to touch a lot on the subject we talked about today as far as history and reality. Um, is the uh, shipwrecked in the land of King Tobacco, the first Washington family immigrant to America. Uh, John Washington, George's great-grandfather, moved to Virginia in a time when there were still a lot of free black landowners working their land. Um, he was only a generation or two removed from the first Dutch ships bringing slaves and over time replacing the indentured servant program that had been in place and it touches a lot on Bacon's Rebellion. Before Bacon's Rebellion, you saw a lot of unity between Native Americans, white settlers, black settlers, and everybody else who came. After, you started seeing uh, more divisions along um, ethnicities as uh, England and their new king kind of cracked down on it. So this book tells a lot of that story. Anyway, friends, Look forward to talking to you next time. We've got a couple fascinating stories coming up in the coming weeks. So I hope you'll stick with us. I hope you'll watch videos we've put out already. I hope you will subscribe. And the most important thing you can do to help this channel is to share the videos, buy a book, or catch something from our Teespring store like a t-shirt or coffee mug. God bless you.